Great Scott, what's the Batmobile doing in Alaska? Beats me, but strap on your utility belt as we go cross country this week on Motoring 98. TSN's Motoring 98 is brought to you by Quaker State. The big Q stands for quality, always has, always will, and Midas for new longer lasting performance friction carbon metallic brake pads. Hello everybody and welcome to Motoring 98. Well, I couldn't resist it. Here I am, knee deep in this Alaskan river, looking for that famous Alaskan salmon. Now, we're out here to check out Volvo's new wagon. It's called the Cross Country. We'll talk more about that later on. But first, you may be noticing fewer Volvo dealerships, both in Canada and the United States in the near future. And as we're about to see, Volvo is prepared to take some, but not all the credit for this latest trend. In 1994, Volvo had 50 dealerships in Canada and sold 3,400 cars. Today, the number of dealers has shrunk to 40, but sales have topped 7,000, and Volvo is hoping to end the current year with 10,000 sales. So how does a company post record sales with fewer dealerships? Well, Volvo, like most other car makers, has had too many unprofitable dealerships and decided it was time to shed the fat. With less owners, there is a little bit less competition between um, the same make, Volvo, and, and, and another Volvo. The economy scale is much, much better. I mean, we need less people in the administration. Instead of two controllers for two dealers, we need one. Um, it is easier to order cars, because if you have a sales of 100, and now it's 200, it's easier. And you can have less cars in your inventory. So Volvo's bottom line is improving. But what about the customer? Volvo believes consumers will drive a little further to buy a car, but it's service that keeps them coming back. In 1993, we had 55 outlets. Everybody has sales, service, and ports. Today, we have around 55 outlets, but we have six service points. And the service point is where you, you can serve, have a service for your car. There is a car in the showroom, but you cannot buy a car. So right now we have six of these service points across Canada uh, from Montreal to Vancouver and the technicians are fully trained by the factory. They use only Volvo original parts. The warranties are honored as if they would be at a full-fledged dealership. And the look of this place is the same as it will look all across the country. This one here is connected to uh, Volvo Villa which is at the corner of uh, Young and Steels which is not that far away but quite a drive if you're going across the, the, the city and they're connected electronically uh, to the uh, to the main computer where the service files are common to this place or uh, the uh, the mothership as we call it or Volvo Villa so therefore the customers coming here are going to the other place there's no difference it's the same quality of service the same tools this is uh, totally staffed and tooled the same as a larger dealership it, they make money here, but that's not the intent. As long as they break even, they're happy with that. But it supplies the main store uh, with the, uh, the flow of repeat customers that they need to, uh, to make that business viable. So Volvo's decision to downsize its dealership appears to be successful. But now Mercedes-Benz has made a decision that could affect Volvo's showroom presence. Mercedes is telling dealers like this one that sell both product that if they want the brand new red hot Mercedes sport utility, the ML320, they have got to get rid of the Volvos. The question is why? And is this the beginning of a new trend as manufacturers enjoy the sweet smell of success? We'll find out on a future edition of Motoring 98. I get honked all the time and people are like, Melanie, Melanie, like this, and I look and I don't know who anybody is because their cars all look the same.
On this edition of Test Drive, we take a look at the first new Nissan pickup truck in almost a dozen years. Now, this is the 98 Frontier. A few trivia buffs. This is the first time Nissan have ever named one of their pickups. Start with the chassis. It's been stiffened in a number of areas. The rear frame rails have been stiffened and a new structural cross member has been added and the mounting point for the power steering is now full width and consequently much stronger. Combine these improvements give the Frontier a tighter feel, particularly in the rough stuff. Inside, Nissan have used a lot more sound deadening material and added a rubber backing to the carpet. Both engine and tyre noise are subdued. Perhaps the most significant improvement to the Frontier is right here, it's the engine. Gone is the old three valve per cylinder single overhead cam unit in favour of this, a four valve per cylinder double overhead cam engine. Now this engine yields a number of benefits. First of all, it's got 143 horsepower, it's got a much better torque curve, but best of all, it's about a mile per gallon better off than the old engine. Now that comes in spite of the fact that this new truck is actually heavier than the one it replaces. Compared to the old engine, the new one is smoother in operation and tends to be a lot less peaky. That said, you do notice the fact that peak torque is generated at 4,000 RPM as compared to 3,600 in the previous engine, meaning a much heavier workout for the gas pedal. In 1999, the Frontier will be offered with a 3.3 litre V6. All things being equal, I think I'd wait if I were in the market. That demonstrates my pet peeve quite graphically. This vehicle, two-wheel drive, only comes with rear ABS, meaning if you lock up the front wheels, you lose total steering control, as I just did. If you do want full ABS, you have to go to the 4x4 model, which is, of course, more expensive. Now, here I thought we were heading into the 21st century, not back to the 19th. You know, usually there isn't a great deal to talk about in the bed of a pickup truck. Well, on this Nissan, they've added some special recesses. This allows you to segment the box with 2x10 boards. It also gives you the availability of a two-tier storage system. Small point, perhaps, but you know, it's the small things that make the big difference. If somebody blindfolded you and stuck you behind the wheel of this pickup truck, you'd be hard-pressed to tell you were actually sitting one because it's very passenger car-like. First of all, great set of analog gauges. Use a friendly climate control and radio, although my preference would be for them to be reversed in their order. You've even got steering wheel mounted cruise control buttons and a very comfortable set of seats. The other thing you've got, an ignition key defeat for the passenger side airbag. This now means that you can carry a rearward facing child seat in the front seat of this pickup truck with safety. Elsewhere, on the safety front, Frontier gets proper side impact members, ALR, ELR seat belts, meaning you can install a child seat properly, and at long last, there is a formal front crumple zone. Lastly, I would be remiss if I did not propagate a rumor, and that is that Nissan have a sport utility truck in the works, one based on this very truck. If true, this could make Pathfinder's life a little interesting. Well, that's it for this edition of Test Drive. You know, Nissan expect to sell about 2,500 Frontiers in 1998, and I don't doubt that claim. They've got a good engine, a good suspension. All they need now is a decent ABS system. You know us at Motoring, we never spare the expense. This week we bring you the 1999 Porsche 911. If you're looking for a car that will appeal to the ardent extrovert, the new 911 is not for you. Rather, the first major rework in 34 years will appeal to a broader audience. One that likes a slightly softer ride, a more user-friendly interior, and a trunk that will, at long last, hold two pieces of carry-on-sized luggage. The tail-happy trait of old has gone, and the new 3.4 litre flat six, while still rear mounted and rear wheel drive, is now water instead of wind cooled. The horsepower rises to a cool 296 and torque peaks at 258 pounds feet. The transmissions are also new a cable connected six speed manual or a new five speed Tiptronic. The latter, as sacrilegious as it may seem, is the better option. 
Now for the numbers. 0 to 100 kilometers an hour is a blistering 5.2 seconds, 80 to 120 takes about 4 seconds, and the top speed is 175 miles an hour. We've learned to love an old friend even when it's got a dirty face. Can we learn to love a new friend? That's coming up later on Kenzie's Corner. Our Midas tip of the week concerns avoiding a sticky situation. Probably the most frustrating part of car ownership is being on the side of the road trying to install your spare tire when you've got a flat and the wheel won't come off. It's happened to a lot of people. Usually a sharp blow with your foot will dislodge the wheel. We showed you that previously. But here's how you avoid that situation altogether. When your vehicle's in for wheel or tire servicing, tire rotation, or brake inspection, have the technicians put a little bit of grease or anti-seize compound in this pilot hole, right around this area here, and that'll completely prevent the wheel from sticking or seizing on, and it'll also make brake servicing a whole lot easier too, because it's the same area that locates and centers the brake drum or rotor. It'll make your life a whole lot easier if you do this once a year. That's your Midas tip of the week. A portion of Motoring 98 is brought to you by the Solder Seal Gunk family of automotive products, makers of Puncture Seal Gold and Liquid Wrench. Here on Motoring, we're always looking out for cars that stand out in a crowd. Well, when we spotted Melanie Melody in her bright pink cabriolet, we knew we had a winner although the interview did get off to a slow start. It's a Volkswagen Cabriolet. It's a convertible. It's 96. 96? 95. It's a 95. Yeah. Let me try that one again. <laughs> it's a 95? 85. 85! You're right, it is. Sorry. It's 80. <laughs> Melanie, tell me first uh, what kind of car you have here and how long you've had it for. Okay, it's a 1985 Cabriolet convertible, Volkswagen and I've had it for about 13 years. When I first got it, I really wanted a black one and they gave me a white one and I hated the white one and the white one kept getting hit all the time, especially in the winter. So I decided I had to paint it pink. That's what started this. The most specific things on the car are on the dash I have Beetlejuice characters, which are from a cartoon that my husband produces. And I have dice, um, I have paint, which is acrylic paint. It's uh, pink and white and black. I have little bowling trophies down the front, and I have um, a good luck horseshoe with a uh, red pepper hanging from it down the right on the front where the Volkswagen emblem is. I have uh, little Barbie doll arms around the the wheel thingies, and I've got um, more dice and uh, rhinestones and jewels, and I have uh, my initials right at the back. And I have, uh, what else do I have on there? Oh, the baby dolls that are along the top, the Cupid dolls. Actually, I used to have baby doll arms that were on there and they had little bottles in them. But somebody came in the middle of the night to my house and they stole them all, which was really a bummer. And, and plus they broke off all the bowling trophies. And I got up in the morning and everything was gone. And so I had to replace it all. Plus I had to repaint the entire uh, hood again. So that was a bummer. <laughs> Hi there, remember me? I was in the LTD MTJ 501. Mmm, you look like you'd be fun. <laughs> I've been working on a new record uh, with the boys from Great Big Music, and a lot of my songs uh, do incorporate cars and driving and truckers. And uh, I have one, one new hit single called Cruising Down the 401. That's a very cool song. <laughs> Well, we got good comments and bad comments. We've got uh, comments like, uh, that's a great car, and uh, I wish I could have that car. And then there are the comments that are like, ew, that car's horrible, or uh, what a dumb looking car. And it's, it's, it's a mixture. I mean, we've got more good than bad, but like everybody's entitled to their own opinion. Does any of the stuff uh, have special significance to you, like that special meaning why you put it in the car? No. No, I, I love it all. I mean, it's all, you know, it, I mean, the more I do it, the more special it all becomes to me. Like, it's, it's a whole, it's a piece. It's an art piece in progress. I need, like, tons of more stuff. I, I have to completely cover it. I mean, people think, they think it looks pretty wacky right now, but it looks like nothing compared to how it's going to look when it's completely covered, and then it'll be pretty wild. Good. That's pretty cool. 
Well, I'm still standing out here in the rain waiting for the big one on this Alaskan River. As I mentioned earlier, we're out here to see the new Volvo. And joining me from the company is Oki Bengstrom. And Oki, I guess the question we want to ask is, is this vehicle, the XC, a brand new vehicle or just a new version of a present platform? Uh, what we have done is to base it on the V70, the current V70, using the all-wheel drive. We have uh, increased the height of the vehicle, working with the suspension, springs, struts, shock absorbers. We have added also a different exterior, a bit more rug surface, bumpers, side moldings, and it also carries a unique interior. And that's why we think there is, we believe strongly that there is a big group of people who would like something more fuel efficient, more car-like when it comes to comfort and handling, and that's the V70. XC. Well, okay, good luck with the cross country and hopefully you'll bring us some luck out here on this Alaskan River as we continue to cast for that big salmon. Well, it's now time to leave this river here in Alaska and head to the garage and join Bill Gardner, a man I know would love to be out here with us, standing in the rain, fishing. Right, Bill? Well, Brad, I'll tell you, as beautiful as that Alaska trip sounds, uh I just don't have the patience for fishing, so I think I'll pass on that fishing trip. But I'll tell you, we had something, we had a job come in the other day, and there was something fishy about this deal. This engine that you see in front of me on the engine stand came out of a 93 Buick LeSabre with 183,000 on it. And all of a sudden, the engine just let go. Now, when they drove this thing in the parking lot, it put down a stripe of oil everywhere it went, and where, where the car stopped, there was a big pool of oil. So you can get the idea that there was one heck of an engine oil leak. Now, the teenage kids were driving the car, and the story the father got was that the engine never got low of oil. Well, I think there was something kind of fishy about that deal, but we never could figure it out. I mean, it was full when we got it with this major leak, so it either just happened or somebody had filled it up after the damage had occurred. Now, what I want to show you this week is we're going to pull the engine oil pan off this engine and show you the, the relationship of oil level in the crankcase. With the engine out of the car and on this stand, it's a pretty easy deal for us to pull the pan off and have a look at a couple interesting things inside here. I just left one screw in the pan. I'm going to remove that and pull the pan off. Now, I'll roll the engine back down to its normal attitude. This is the way it would be in the car. And if I hold the pan up against the side of the block, you can see the relationship of the engine oil pickup, which is right here, to the floor of the pan. The pickup goes right to the floor of the pan and tries to pick up the last little drop of oil out of that engine. Now, on this engine, we've got a low oil level sensor. It's halfway up the pan right here. But remember, not all cars have that feature. It's a nice feature, but you can't rely on it because your car may not have it. And even if it does, it's no substitute for checking the dipstick. There's the dipstick hanging down inside the pan over here. There's the uh, add oil level there and the full oil mark up there. And you can see that even when it's down almost off the tip of the stick, there's still enough to cover that oil pickup and make some engine oil pressure, which is going to keep the engine oil pressure light off. If we bring the oil pan up, you can see inside the pan, there's the business end of the low oil level sensor hanging inside the pan. Remember that our oil pickup goes right down through this hole in the, uh, in the windage tray, right down to the floor of the pan. This baffle here, we refer to as the windage tray, and it controls oil that's slung off the crankshaft at high engine speed. And another thing that we've noticed lately is we've had a few cars coming in with the oil level grossly over full. And when that situation occurs, the oil level comes up and gets up to the level of the crankshaft uh, throws, those counterweights that you see on the bottom of the crank. I'll turn the engine up a bit, and as I turn it over, you can see the counterweights right here coming around. And if the oil level gets up to that height where they could plow through it, it's really going to hamper your engine performance. You remember running on that hard sand at the top of the beach? Well, it's pretty easy to run there, but if you go down and try and run through the water, it's kind of tough. Well, it's the same deal in here. If that crank's got to plow through standing oil, it's going to really hurt the performance. And it's also going to aerate the oil. It turns it into like a milkshake and puts all kinds of bubbles in it. Now, the bottom line here is that even though this engine has a low oil level indicator and an, and an engine oil pressure switch, we still don't want to rely on those too heavily. They're nice to have but you still should be checking that engine oil level on the dipstick here. Pull her out at least once a week, check your engine oil level, and adjust it as necessary. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 98.
okay. It's funny when you think about it, we like cars for their virtues, but we love cars because of their failings. Take the old Porsche 911. The ride was hard, it was cramped inside, there was no luggage space. The dashboard was an ergonomic disaster. It was a very difficult car to drive quickly, particularly in the rain, and yet people love this car with unbridled passion. Well, now we have an all new Porsche 911. It's larger inside, it's wider particularly, much more luggage space, it's more comfortable, it's quieter, it's faster, it's better handling by far, it's a bit longer, and it's still a very beautiful car. But are we going to learn to love this car as much as we love the old one? Because it doesn't have any faults. Now I know for a fact when the original 911 was introduced in 1964, Porsche fans said it can't be a real Porsche because it's not a 356. And they're going to say the same thing about this car because it's too nice, it's too comfortable, it doesn't have any faults. But I think 30 years from now, we're going to say, this is still a pretty good car. Hi, Jim Kent. So, there you have it. Despite the conditions, my patience paid off. You're looking at about a 9 to 10 pound silver salmon caught right here by yours truly in this Alaskan river. You know, I seem to have a bit of a talent for this sport. Maybe I should approach TSN about doing a fishing show. I don't think anybody else is doing one right now. Not a bad idea. Anyway, that's it for now. We'll see you next week for more stories about cars and the people who drive them. We off? Okay. Okay, thanks for the use of your fish. Boy, good fish. I'm, I'm telling you what I feel about this country is uh, opportunity, opportunity, opportunity. You know, you have a dream, just, you know, hang on to it and go for it. TSN's Motoring 98 has been brought to you by Quaker State. The big Q stands for quality, always has, always will. And Midas, for new, longer-lasting, performance friction carbon metallic brake pads.